Ladies and gentlemen, we are entering the oldest part of Tonopah. This is where all the mines, mills, mining cabins, equipment, head frames. This is part of the Mispa mine. And what it was, the guy was telling me that it's, uh, it was, they dug down about 200 feet, made, mined it. It was a big cavern. And just like limestone caverns, where limestone gets eroded and collapses, this entire pit collapsed. It wasn't a pit, but the mine had collapsed the ceiling, and this is what you get left. So where you guys want to go first, man? You want to go down to this, the right side? We'll go here first. I got a little segment I'm doing on the Tonopah Railroad, the Tonopah Goldfield Railroad. That's the original tracks right there. Pretty cool. Oh yeah. This is awesome. I mean, there is so much to do here. And as you can see, there's Tonopah. And Tonopah was discovered, there's a multiple stories. Some people say Jim Butler threw a rock at his burrow and discovered it was ore. Other people say that the burrow kicked it over and he picked it up and looked. Because sometimes the silver is bluish colored and realize it was high grade ore. Pre mining equipment, drum hoist. All the equipment's original, although some of it was brought in from other mining districts nearby. That's a five stamp machine. There's five stamps or ore crushers. Do you see them on that machine? Yeah, that's a five. That's small compared to some of the mills that have 40 of those stamps. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. It says on the plaque, right? the pile of stones that are left here was actually the original Tonopah Mining Office. The Tonopah Mining Company Office. It was destroyed in the 1960s. The stones were hand cut from a quarry near Mount Brofner. So you can kind of see the stones. Oh yeah. Relics of the past, man. It says that life in the mining camp at Tonopah was quite lonely. A lot of the men lived in tents. Water was only from the street seven miles away. Food was brought in. We already know that. The same goes with Belmont or any of these ghost towns. In 1901, the camp consisted of tents and wooden dwellings, and they called it Butler, in name of the founder. And then they changed the name to Tonopah. Of course, you can see this is the same cabin. Well, it's not the same, but it's similar, similar in design, and all the miners sitting in front of it. Because back in the day, life was simple. Tonopah, here's what Tonopah looked like in 1901. Tents and wood buildings. It was very simple, and it was very cold in the winter, because in a tent, you really couldn't keep very warm. Silvertop, Grizzly, we're going to go to the Grizzly mining area and mill, and then there's an open stoke loop where you can see all the debris piles and stones. This is really cool. It's home of the Desert Queen Mine, where Butler filed his first claim or found silver ore. But this is a really great place. And I, and I do think that we're going to get some great pictures, some good results here. And everything's labeled, because Tonopah is very historic. And people don't even really think about it very much, but this is where the gold's at. Not technically, but silver was the main cream of the crop. However, however, no less, this is the oldest part of Tonopah. This is where the town originally started was here, and then it's, it kind of vamped out a little bit. This is the Silver Top Mine. You can see a picture with the old locomotive. It says Jim and Bell Butler, along with their associates, sold the claim to investors who formed the Tonopah Mining Company. In 1902, development began at the Silver Top Claim. A shaft was sunk 700 feet 
Keep in mind, these shafts are deep. And eventually a wooden head frame was constructed. Extending head frame off to the right in the photo below, you can see the train. We're going to go right under it, where the train used to pass by. Extended from the head frame, two tiers of ore cart tracks are shown entering the Grizzly. And the Grizzly was, well, obviously they process the ore. And it says right here, it says, it says the appearance of the separator, which had space between the bars about two inches width, about the distance between a Grizzly's bare claws. So now you know how it had gotten its name. It says ore that likely contained silver gold was emptied from the ore cars in the bins and dumped in the waiting rail cars, waste rock was dumped on the side, which is this huge dump pile. That's what they call them. And then, of course, the Tonopah Rail was built by the Tonopah Mining Company, believe it or not. So it, it, the railroad is very connected to the mines here. And in 1904, a narrow gauge line with tracks three feet in width were built, and almost a year later it was converted to a standard, which had a track of four feet eight inches in width. And, of course, that ran to Goldfield, Rhyolite, and Las Vegas. This is when the Tonopah Rail was converted to narrow gauge. A standard gauge in 1905 was then extended south to the boom town of Goldfield, like I was saying. And then they renamed it the Tonopah and Goldfield Railroad. So, pretty cool. We're going to go check out the mine. I don't know if these places are haunted, but I'll run EVPs. Maybe I'll get something peering at me out the window. That would be really awesome. It's pretty pretty cool see this is where the railroad had ran right underneath the mill and then they would dump the ore into the carts and the line would extend to the from the mines to the main line I mean it was really when you think about it they had a really good system for being over a hundred years ago was quite advanced. Most of these mines and mills were if you wanted to get the gold and silver out of the ore. And then you had to smelt it and ship it out or process it. It wasn't a matter of just mining. You had to do much more if you wanted the gold and the silver. This is called a head frame. And head frames were very relevant because generally the head frames were built over the mine itself over a shaft. Now today I'm going to stand on a mine shaft, but I'll explain it later when we get there. Because you're probably like, we have the honor of being able to come up here and check out this wonderful place. Like I said, it's a huge part of Tonopah history. It doesn't matter what others think. When you come to Ghost Town, it's not about thrills and frills. It's about getting out there and seeing these historic sites which someday in a hundred years this place probably won't even exist but thanks to the curators of these museums and these locations they're doing everything like I am doing to preserve such locations and mills in wild western frontier history oh this is so cool good for EVPs too gotta get them ghosts you know what I'm saying it's not. <laughs> Woo! Woo! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I get a little carried away. <coughs> it's, a, it's a kid in me. It gets a little carried away. I don't really feel comfortable standing on this, but okay. I hope the stope isn't this way. <laughs> oh, cool. Look at that. It just dumps down to the ore carts when the train used to go over. That is Bad ass. It's bad ass. But how does it Stay like this. You know what? This is pretty. This is pretty cool. We're up. We're up in the grizzly. This is a grizzly, right? Yes, this is a grizzly. All these names of these mills are like ten different mills and mines here. And they all have their own labels and names and competing with each other like you know how McDonald's and Burger King build next to each other? Well, you'll have two mills side by side competing with each other. This is cool. And you can see, ladies and gentlemen, these are ore cart tracks. And there's ore carts actually on them. It's a really cool place. A really cool place. And that's Tonopah, the town of Tonopah below. 
the town started here and then it grew up to the mount you know grew out to the mountains you see ahead in this little hilltop mining town it's very vast out here very vast but it says the original lower portion of the ore bin was built in 1905 when the railroad reached the site. It used, it used to load ore cars on the Tonopah and Goldfield Railroad, hauled it to the Tonopah Mining Company mill at Miller's, 12 miles west of here. The Grizzly ore sorting portion was added in 1915, and the Grizzly, all the work for the mine, was hand sorted by grade, and with the best going to the mill and the others going to the dump. During most of the life of the Tonopah Mining District, silver sold for an average of 40 cents an ounce. The storage dump was shipped later in years when the price of silver went up. All mining and ore sorting was done by hand. Every bit of rock in the Parks Mine dump was moved at least once by a man with a shovel. I would not want to shovel these mining dumps. Days and days and days of work. Hell, it's like here's a mine dump. He got about a year. He got about a year to shovel. This is a silver top mine right here. Silver top shaft was sunk in 1905 and was the second working shaft in the Tonopah Mining Company. It was 1,200 feet deep. That's the shaft. Yes, the shaft is closed. And below, pay very close attention. That's historic Tonopah. All historic. Actually, I should say that's downtown right here. And then you got your housing on the edge of town. Wow. Whoa, that is crazy. That is a lot of iron and equipment. Oh, this is too cool. I love this. Huh? I don't feel safe in there. Well, you can you can take my pick in the room or something. I I, I don't the floors are moving over the holes. Yeah. Whoa, the floor is cracking. I hope I don't fall through. It's a long ways down. Clutch and brake. There's there's. Oh, the control. This is the control room. Yeah. Here's the chair. Here's the wood stove. Here's the levers. It controls the belts and everything else for the mine. That mine's 1,200 feet deep. The mine that's out there, it says 1,200 feet. There was miles of tunnels under Tonopah. Virginia City has 700 miles. Tonopah probably has a good 100, 200 miles of tunnels as well. I mean, these silver mines ran deep. If it went 1,200 feet down, then you had miles of tunnels all under Tonopah. All under these mountains. It is crazy. It is crazy. While Butler may have found the ore, he didn't have. He, there's so many stories. He says he went looking for his lost pearl, and it wandered off during the night. And he's seen an outcropping of silver. And then someone say he threw a rock at the burrow. Others say he, he stumbled upon it when the burrow kicked it. I don't know what it is, but you have to understand that Butler did not have a lot of money. It took men of wealth and men who had money to back up these claims and build the mills for processing it. Invest in these silver war sites. George Winfield, George Winfield, he was a 24-year-old poker player when he arrived in Antonopah to play poker. He had talked to a someone named Jack Carey. He was the owner of the Tonopah Club. And they made him, they took him in as a partner. And they filed a game in 1903. by was right against the Chinese workers of Tonopah, which spurred a boycott in China of U.S. goods. Just some famous people. However, George Wingfield in 1904 invested his winnings in the Boston Tonopah Mining Company. Wingfield was worth over two million. George S. Nixon, a friend of his, was a banker arrived in town. He invested in the Nye County Bank. And in with another partner or friend, Nick Abelman, they bought existing mines and claims in the area, making them worth over $30 million. And of course, when the mines were exhausted, 
they began investing in real estate and casinos in the region. And there are a lot of casinos and homes here. Tonopah is quite large. And of course, by 1920s, this town was merely reduced. And when I say reduced, you know, when you have 15,000 people and all of a sudden it dwindles down to a couple thousand in a matter of a few years due to the mines becoming exhausted, that's exactly what I'm talking about. You know, some of these towns had 20, 30,000 people today. Like, like, when you look at Belmont, it had probably 15,000 residents at one time at its peak. And today there's probably 20 people living up. And of course, you know, when the mining had stopped, a lot of these individuals who no longer were able to mine invested in casinos and gambling and saloons and all that. And nearby is the Tonopah test range. Yes, they test missiles and nukes and everything else back in the Cold War. I took you guys to the old military base, but not too far from here. The test range has a giant crater where they had launched a nuke. It's pretty crazy, but it's the truth. That's what Nevada's known for. He used to be able to see those nukes go off for 100 miles away. Says 1900 horse drawn ore wagon. That's cool. That's history, man. Man, this snow is pretty. This, this snow is pretty damn deep. Look at that. Now we're hiking in snow. It's all good. When there was news that silver was very rich, because you could see silver veins, there's still silver out here. But when the news arrived, it reached the Klondike. You had miners coming from Alaska all the way down the western coast and ending up in Tonopah. When Butler filed his claim in 1900, they did six claims. Desert Queen, Burrow, Valley View, Silver Top, Miss Butt, and Buckboard. All successful mines, all big producers. Work began in the Mizpah in October 1900. And of course, like I was saying earlier, they called the camp Butler. And on Christmas Day in 1900, 14 men were living in this camp. This very camp we're standing on. Tascarati, Nice County's new district attorney, also senator and governor, also came up here to live. And Adi and Butler, they were partners, but they also lived in Belmont. So now you understand why I did Belmont. Yeah. Belmont, oh shit, don't go, don't leave me, Bunny. The mines around town produced $750,000 in gold, gold and silver in 1901. That was 1901. And for 40 years, Tonopah was mining. And the town at the time in the early 1900s had six saloons, restaurants, SA office, lodging houses, boarding houses, doctors, lawyers, stores, hotels. First wedding took place November 14th in 1901. Newspaper came around the same time. W.W. Booth was the publisher of the paper in Belmont. He set up the Tonopah Bonanza. The first issue had a greeting. It said, with this issue, the Tonopah Bonanza glides down the typographical, typographical ways and into the sea of journalism. It's a lot of freelance writings. The paper listed Butler as the place of the publication until 1905. Booth also was the journalist, but took over for the postmaster from Seclair, duties from a man named by Seclair and served till 1905. You have to understand something, ladies and gentlemen. Belmont and Tonopah are physically sister mining towns. The founders of Tonopah and the mine owners first lived in Belmont and owned the mines in Belmont. Belmont died and Tonopah was the new thing. Everybody's like, yeah, let's move to Tonopah. It's growing. And it did grow. Some people say as many as 20,000 lived here. Some people say as many as 25,000. It was a big town. This is called Bell's Mine. The Miss Bell Mine was christened by Bell Butler. For Bell to be so involved with the business of mining is unusual. In 1900, women were not even allowed to vote or be on juries or hold office. However, 
they, they considered it men's work, but more than one historian attributes the overwhelming success of the Mispa mine due to Bell Butler. Shortly after staking the claim, the Butlers partnered with, partnered with a young attorney named Tasker Adi, as a prospector, and Wills Bruffner. Between them, they came up with 25 hours to begin workings in the mine. They produced nearly two tons of ore and sent it off by a mule team to Austin and in the Salt Lake and a smelter where a smelter would take the silver out of the rock. They receive a check for 500 hours, hire workers, and rest assured, that's when Tonopah really began the boom. Eventually, Jim Butler had sold his claims. Like I said, mines were an investment. And it gave birth to the Tonopah Mining Company, which was obviously the largest company here. They owned multiple claims and mills. And were responsible for the railroad. It was incorporated in Delaware, the stock was listed in both Philadelphia and San Francisco exchanges, and they controlled about 160 acres of mineral bearing ground and mines in the Tonopah district, this very district where they're standing at. Of course, during the Depression and after World War I, mine production has slowed down. The main production was from 1900 to 1921, and the peak year is almost produced 121 million. In 1913, 10 million in gold, silver, and copper were mined here. And by World War II, only four major mining companies operated. A huge fire in 1942 destroyed the Tonopah Extension Mill and property. It spread to a hotel, it caused 100,000 damage. At the end of the war, these companies had left. In 1947, the Tonopah and Goldfield Railroad had closed. Wow, look at that head frame. Woohoo! That is huge. That must be a. 2,000, I'm guessing over 2,000 foot shaft that's in front of us. I'm coming. I'm coming. In 1968, Howard Hughes had operated Summa Corporation, bought 100 claims in Tonopah. Yes, when I was in Buffalo, they had a Howard Hughes uh, center. Wow, look at this. But Howard Hughes... Howard Hughes bought up a lot of claims. That includes the Mispa, Silvertop, Desert Queen, all large mines. He was going to bring a revival to the area, and a few of the old mines were retimbered but never reopened. The total production, as I was saying yesterday, was over $150 million. Wow. Howard Hughes cyanide test columns. It's not cool. A pickaxe? Yeah. And it's so This must be the workshop. See all the tools? See the drill bit? And the old blower? And a vise? Calipers? Interesting. That's what we need for our fireplace, right? Really heat things up. There's one cushion Your hat's sticking all the way up. Gnome, you know, that's why I put on my cowboy hat. I'm like, I'm not gonna look like a gnome on in, around here <laughs> Oh in the old register This is before they had everything electronic you just push the buttons you have to have an even amount 10 20 30 40 50 60 70 80 to 100 What's in there? I don't know It's all closed in. A bunch of boxes. Please, please give me some voltage. I need it. <laughs> I don't know. Where do you hang up your hat on that? What more could I ask? Where I'm doing a paranormal investigation of the mill in the mining district and where the town originally started. I can't ask for more. Being a paranormal investigator this is every person's dream out here in the wild west is to be able to have an opportunity to see something like this. Not just for the history, but these places all have ghost stories. And there's energy here. And it's very well preserved. So you gotta love that. There's the levers for the controls. Like I've seen in the other mill, very similar. Just pull down on them. Each mechanism controls something. Very simple, very simple machinery to operate. Didn't take a rocket scientist.
thousands of pounds of rock from the depths of the earth were pulled up from this head frame. It says it weighed about 60,000 pounds, could hoist a seven ton load. They called it the cage. And basically it would lower down and it'd go a thousand feet a minute. And this is to the MISPA. Oh, by the way, guys, I was right. This mine's 3,000 feet deep. Well, it says right here, it says it was capable of hoisting 10 tons from a depth of 3,000, but it says the MISPA mine was 1,500 feet deep. Still, 1,500 is a pretty deep mine. I think we need to get a nice tripod shot over these overlooks. It's too bad. It's so friggin' chilly out today. What are you gonna do? Wow. Let's see what we got here. There are some notable people that also lived in Tonopah. As I was saying yesterday, Hugh Brandner, a physicist, inventor of the wetsuit. Brian Callister, MD, physician, nationally known healthcare policy expert, practiced in Tonopah between 1991 and 1995. Barbara Graham, notorious butcher of Burbank, one of four women to be executed in California, lived here. William Robert Johnson, Roman Catholic Bishop of Orange. Andriza Brkovich, only prisoner to be executed by shooting in Nevada. And then, of course, you have Tascarati, who was the 12th governor and U.S. senator and a resident of Tonopah and Belmont. Stalking Cat lived here. Modern body modification. Clear Fahey, pioneer of avian engines, died here in 1930 after an airplane she was piloted crashed when the engine stalled at 50 feet at takeoff near the airport we were at. Hence why I investigated, because there has been some deaths and accidents. What do we got here, guys? Is this a good tripod area? Uh, I do want to get a few family shots of like the town and ore cart tracks would dump all the ore at the bottom come right to the edge dump the ore and then of course the men would shovel and sift through it because they did it by hand here they didn't really process it using machinery like they should. And so other mining camps did that. Not this mining camp. Yeah, it's cold up here. So ladies and gentlemen, you've seen some very relevant areas of Tonopah's history. You can see there's nothing out here. It's vast. Nothing but mountains covered in snow. Vast desert everywhere. People think that this is a joke out here. If you left Tonopah, you risked your life back in the day. Especially if you were riding a horse. We've been very thorough. This is not even a train. I thought this was a train, man. Huh? They're all breaking off. Look. What? I know it's a truck. Rick. See, Rick. They put that there just for me. Man, we're going to have to get a better picture. It's really windy out here. That's the only thing I'm worried about is tripods. All embedded in the snow. <laughs> the pile of piping that you see, I'll show you. There's some piping. But anyhow, the piping was used to send air down to the mine for ventilation since the mines were so deep. And I guess this building, this is a framing building. Sorrows were mounted inside the building and all timber for the Tonopah Mining Company was cut and sized here. So basically this was kind of like a lumber mill. And of course they stored some 
piping for the mines next to here and then they would lay the pipe down in the mine so the miners had ventilation in here oh yeah this is cool dude there's mines oh yeah look at the old bottles this is history man you know you have to you really have to appreciate it originally ladies and gentlemen Yet the part of me, one thing I do want to apologize for is that that the wind is really severe. So if the video sound, you hear wind and you can't really hear me, the winds are whipping. We're in the middle of winter and I'm in the middle of Tonopon, six, seven thousand feet up almost. So you need to understand that conditions here were harsh. Life was harsh in the West. However, inside my films will come out quiet because we're inside buildings that have windows. I mean, you still see slats but we're shielded from the wind. So every time I go in a building, I'll make sure I at least film and talk to our viewers. This here that you see in front of us is an original mine, miner's tent. When they had the camp, before the building sprung up in any of the camps, they started as tent camps, which consisted of just a few pieces of wood holding up some canvas. And you know, you, people would make these in the homes. They have a little wood stove, Maybe a desk, a table to eat at, and a little bed and a chest with their goods. And all this could be loaded on a wagon, and a horse, a horse, couple horses could pull it, and you could move on to the next mining camp. But this is where the wood was cut. This is basically like a sawmill, a lumber mill. They cut the wood to size, and then they would use it inside the, the mines surrounding this building. And ladies and gentlemen, you see this debris pile? This debris pile is so large that it's three, four stories high. So technically, you probably hit, you can tell right now based on that debris pile, the shafts and the tunnels probably went for miles. Miles. You could tell. You could tell. Wow. Huh? Dude, they say the mass is a photography. Dude, this is the old warehouse for the Tonopah Mining Company. Everything, all the equipment, anything related to the mine was stored here. Tools, equipment, anything. Anything it could be was stored in this red building. And usually it's open, but due to winter, some of the buildings are closed or off limits right now. It could be also because, you know, people come up here and steal. Like in this building, there's old bottles. I have no doubt people come and try to steal them. It's wrong to steal, and you shouldn't do it, but people try to do it anyways. I, like I said, I'm not in agreement with it. If, if you touch, if you steal, and you don't preserve these artifacts, they'll be gone forever. And then nobody else can enjoy them. So if you come here, don't touch anything. Seriously, just admire it for what it is. If you see dust on it, it gives it character. Leave it alone. Just enjoy it. Just enjoy it. All that remains of the Tonopah Goldfield Railroad is that trestle and some tracks. We'll definitely be approaching it. Probably from the bottom, you're not allowed to stand on it. It's amazing, ladies and gentlemen, but everything is so well preserved in Tonopah. You can go to a lot of ghost towns, but they're secluded and people come by with trucks and they take the mine carts and put them on their property. Not nah, here. Everything's, there's always been someone here, as a caretaker was telling me just now. And therefore, it's very well preserved. All the way from the equipment to the machinery to the mine carts to the mills. Everything is well preserved. And Tonopah is a really dismal place. When you think about it, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's secluded from society. There's mines everywhere you look. There are mines. Deep shafts. You're not far from Area 51 and Groom Lake. Yes, I've been to Groom Lake. Yes, I've seen two UFOs out there. Yes, I did a haunted mine next to Groom Lake or on the edge of Groom Lake in a ghost town. So you have to understand, there's a lot, there's UFOs, there's a lot of ghost stories. This is a area where you want to look for the paranormal. Oh, here's the silver vein. This 
is when prospectors wandered in the Nevada desert, they looked at specific types of combinations of rock. Only often certain rocks, such as quartz in this vicinity, would signal the presence of gold or silver. In 1900, Jim Butler found silver-bearing quartz, which led to the founding of one of the West's premier mining communities, Tonopah. And it was found right here. Veins were found underground, and many of the mines connected to each other through a vast tunnel system right here where we're standing. You can see the debris piles, and with each debris pile, is usually near a mine and they all kind of connected. Near the spot several silver veins break the surface but were never exploited during the mining boom. So you can still see them kind of today if you look. I'll actually, I'll show you where the veins are. Pay very close attention. These are silver veins right here. You can see the veins if you pay attention to the rock. are all veins. You guys can see, if you look, you kind of see the bottom and then it continues to... There's the bottom and it drops off. It's already a hundred feet down and then it probably drops off a few hundred more feet. And it can, the vein continues from here and you can see it goes underneath there's like a tunnel that goes under this road, or was at the time, and they dug different shafts along the sides, but this was a very rich area in silver. Right here is where the claims begin. And you can see through the fence, they got fencing to keep you safe, but you can see that. This is Glory Hole, that's what the caretaker told me this was. The Glory Hole was created in 1922 when a large underground stope cave collapsed. It happened in the evening as the mine was only working one shift at a time. No one was hurt. The size of the stope can be judged by the size of the hole. There are many more large stopes underground. Most in the town of Tonopah where our bodies dipped under the cap rock. From time to time, a crack will open in the town's main street from underground movement. A large section of the east edge of the glory hole is cracked off and double the size of the hole. Some of the original stopes have come to the surface can be seen on the west edge of the cave. And look how deep that is. It was a giant cavern because they kept mining and mining. It made it weaker and weaker. And can you imagine, I mean, this all collapsed at once. It probably caused a little bit of tremors within the town because the whole cavern collapsed and gave way to this area that's a couple hundred feet across, a couple hundred feet deep, and probably about 400 feet lengthwise. You can see it. You can get a better view from this angle of just how big the glory hole is. It's a beautiful place. Beautiful. We're going to climb up the side of the mountain. We're going to go up here and we're going to visit some of the sites that are higher up. That's the Desert Queen. But well, we're going to go up there. There's some cabins and other structures back in there. There's also what appears to be a vault. The vaults were usually stored next to the mines. But you can see, if you look really good, you can see that it looks like a vault. It's very exciting to be here because we have an opportunity to really do a lot of good investigating. We really do. And get a lot of great work done. And when I, when I was talking about Bell and the Mizba mine, Bell Butler, that was Jim Butler's wife. And I'm not sure I mentioned that earlier in my video, but she played a big role in these mines and helped get funding the claims and hiring the miners. This is Tonopah like you've never seen it before. It really is, because there's not a lot of websites that are as extensive as what we're doing here for the Paranormal Ghost Society. We're really covering just about every part of Tonopah on this trip. And it just snowed up here recently, otherwise there'd be no snow here. But it makes things look a little prettier for our little expedition that we're on. You gotta really respect the work that we do. I mean, within three days, you know, when you hit a hundred different sites in three days, because I mean, that's basically what it comes down to. I've already visited a hundred different sites. I mean, it's the same look area, but you know, you're going to this mine, this mill, the trestle, the hotels, downtown, each structure. So, you know, we've been very busy. Sorry, I have lots of mud on my feet. 
So we're going to head up to the, I believe that's the Montana mining camp or Montana mine. And ladies and gentlemen, there is the last woman put to death, she's a killer, lived in a cabin on top of the hill. We're going to go investigate that cabin. You can kind of see how exciting this trip is because I'm bringing such great diversity to our members and our viewers. A little bit of everything on this trip. It's going to be stellar on our site. People will be able to use the research and the pictures, schools, other paranormal investigators. It'll definitely be helpful. Up, up and away. I see some prints. He hasn't been up here because he has that little tractor thing. Nobody's been up here probably. Some great scenic pictures you can get up here though. Eh, it's not too bad. It's not icy at least. It's just snow. Let's do this. <laughs> Let's do this. Yeah. Push, push, push. It's the only way to produce results. If you want to get to where you want to go. Whew, man. Wow. There's the cabin there. It's fast, man. Wow. Unbelievable. It's a cabin, a mill, and that looks like the vault. I'm gonna go smoke one in the vault. Here. Smoke one. stuff is sucking the air out of my lungs so cold and we're almost 7,000 feet up yeah check it out but you guys don't have to come it's over the just down there yeah I seen that on a website the dynamite shack wow it's wicked out it looks like it's getting cloudy you know probably getting more he said we're supposed to they might get a little more snow today I was like oh really Okay, the Montana mill site's just over the hill. I'll have to look and see what mill site this was. There's not a lot that remains. You just have foundations, some rebarb through them. Not too bad. Wow, the views are really awesome. Whew. Definitely worth the climb. Told you, this is part of the Montana. Montana Tona Paul Mine Vault. Oh, the door? Yeah. It says, for this place, the gold and the silver were stored to be shipped out on the railroad. And they said you can, or outside the structure is remains of the company safe. Pranksters blew off the door in the 60s and it was found recently by the Tonopah Conservation Camp. The crew stuck. This is a conservation camp which the crew stuck in the side of the Mispa mine dump. Basically it was underneath the dump. Here's the safe. Here's the door. Here's the vault. Not uncommon to see vaults in ghost towns. You had to store the gold and silver somewhere. You couldn't, I mean, if you just left it out in the open, you'd have miners robbing it and disappearing. It's just, there, you know, there's no honor amongst thieves. And there was a lot of theft in these ghost towns. And there still is go theft going on today. People are taking the bricks, the ore carts, everything out of these towns. And they're either using it on their property. And nothing really remains. But Tonopah? It's very restored all the way from the safe to the door that goes on the vault 
to the ore carts, the mills, the head frames, the structures, the stone buildings, it's all right here for your enjoyment. This fucking zombie outbreak. Are we about to be bombed by the friggin' Russians? You hear that? I'll tell you, in Winnemucca, they do it once a week. That's kind of spooky. Well, that's what they have up in Buffalo. You, Every time there's a fire that breaks out in the suburbs, mm -hmm. that goes off. And the worse the fire, the worse the disaster, it could stay on a half hour like that. Damn. As a kid growing up, when we heard that, I used to get scared out of bed. It was probably a test. Yeah. Better not go off again, because this is some serious shit. I mean, we're kind of near the nuclear test range. I mean, can you imagine you're standing here and you see a friggin' mushroom cloud off in the distance? I'll be like, uh, let's hide behind the walls in the vault. Oh, what's that? See that really far away? Oh, that's, I think that's military, son. Really? Yeah, Air Force. See, nobody seems to be uh, freaking out about it. As a matter of fact, is there anybody even out in this room? Is there anybody out, or is it just us? In a lonely world. All right, I'm gonna get some work done. Hey, hey, when I'm gone, get some snacks out of your bag and eat. There's candy. There's fruit. Eat. I've spent money. You can eat those. Those are yours. You're welcome. I'm out of here. I'll be back in a few. I'm brave in the cold. Do a video record. The Montana. The Montana. Oh yeah, the guy recommended. He's like, I want to go out on the up on the mountains to check. He's like to check out things. There's ice and snow, and I'm like, well, you don't know our family because we just got done hiking through waist deep snow high up in the ghost town of Belmont. And we've done so much extreme adventure, and so what it really comes what it really comes down to is you just I'm not a tourist. I'm one of these guys that really likes to test my limits. So a little snow and a few hills, nah. You might look at me and be like, eh, be careful, you guys may not, you really shouldn't go there. And here we are up here at the, at the top where the Desert Queen and Montana Mill at the Desert Queen is above Tonopah. It doesn't get any better than this. It's cold, but it doesn't get any better than this. Now much remains of the mill. It's not as extensive as one might think. I found another vault. was a Montana Mills dynamite house. You'd store the dynamite here, and the dynamite would be used for blasting tunnels in the Montana mine, because you had the Montana mine, which was up here. You can see the big debris piles. And then the Montana mill, which is this stone ruins. And But you had the TNT kept away from buildings and other sites here. That way, if it ever was to be ignited, it wouldn't injure anyone or destroy any of the mills or mining sites. Pretty cool. This is cool. It's a real deal here. Wow. It's pretty amazing. Oh, man. Holy shit. Wow.
Welcome to Nevada, folks. One of the last remaining frontiers. Wow. Wow. Pretty amazing. Just ran down here. Trying to get to the damn road. It's pretty slippery. A lot of loose rocks. We're going to head to the Desert Queen mine. The Desert Queen was the most successful mine in Tonopah, really. And perhaps one of the larger mines. Because it's the original claim. And I'm gonna, I don't think I'm going to go up to it, but I want to get near it enough where I can get a decent photo to kind of show everyone. North Star and Desert Queen and the Barber Graham House. That's right, the house is down here, along to the Burbank Butcher. A woman who murdered. A gentleman working here, he's a pretty nice guy. Caretaker. He told me, I, I won't walk up there. But the thing is, we have no choice. If you're gonna do a ghost town, you gotta be thorough. I seen a lady on a ghost town site and she took a picture of Belmont and said, oh, it's too big. It'll take days to explore. We did it all one day. We didn't do, everything's closed, so we didn't get to do inside anywhere. But we did manage in one day, half a day, to visit all the major sites. We couldn't get to the mill. The mills, they were snowed in. And the one we couldn't find. And the other one's on private property. However, however, we did manage to be very thorough. It's because people come into a town like this, they look down, they're like, oh, it's too big, I don't want to, we have to spend many days coming back in the future to do the town. You know, people actually spend a good day just hiking on their legs because the people are lazy. That's all it is, it's laziness. They're like, they're like, oh, it's so huge. And then they don't want to hike or explore anything. So that does not make you a good explorer. It's a hoisting cage. Hoist you down in the mines. Some of the mines were great. About 1950, according to caretakers. So this mine have been in the past a lot longer than some. Hypothetically speaking, yes and no. Because when you really look at it, some mining communities started in 1860 and they mined till 1930. While Tonopah started in the mining in the early 1900s and 50 years later it was finished. But it still had a long good run. Now, this is pretty cool. Is it worth the wind and cold? You bet. Home of the Desert Queen and the Northern Star. Desert Queen Mine, I assume the, the Northern Star was the mill, and then this is the mine. Usually, investors would invest in the mill if the mine was profitable. So that way, they could process, they could take a percentage of gold or silver out of the mines while owning that mill. And it had a nice system. And, it, and back then, if you invested in mines like this, or mills, you were fairly well to do. And you lived in these fancy stone houses while the poverty miners, the miners, would live in these small little cabins. An outhouse. And then you guys seen there's a cabin I'll show you. Serial killer. But like I said, the poverty lived in one bedroom little cabins or tents. And the mine owners had beautiful estates and homes down near Main Street. Truth. See piles of ore in the back or alongside the mill. Which still contains silver to this day. And no, you're not allowed to mine it. No less, it's pretty damn cool if you ask me. Wow. 
That is a massive head frame and war shoot. Wow. This is the Desert Queen Hoist House head frame. It's one of the most beautiful head frames in the Wild West. That's why I'm filming. That's why I'm showing you it. All these little tidbits I'm giving you guys during our films out in Tonopah are to give you some insight about what these boom towns were about. 200 years from now, people are going to be visiting my business and my house and they're going to be like, this was Lord Rick's house. They might even have a plaque on it. It might read, you know, one of the top paranormal investigators in the world lived here. I'm just saying. I'm not, I'm not being cocky. I'm just hypothetically saying. I mean, I have an impeccable record in this field with a lot of explorations and, and paranormal investigations and so when you really think about it, you know, it's, I'm making history. We're all making history. We're all contributing to the society and doing something. In this case, it was the miners in connection with Tonopah. But someday, two years from now, someone might have my club residence or what I did in my contribution to history. You just, you just never know. Here's, I'll tell you what it says. Uh, the Desert Queen Mine was originally part of Tonopah Mining Company's buildings and discovered in 1901. However, the growth of nearby Tonopah Belmont developed its compute. However, the growth of nearby Tonopah Belmont Development Company's holdings associated with another access to the underground workings. The Desert Queen was originally part of the Tonopah Mining Company's holdings when it was discovered in 1901. The shaft by 1904 was about 1,100 feet deep and the Belmont there was a Belmont vein and it said that it intersected the Desert Queen shaft and substantial production was made from this mine. The Desert Queen played a vital role during the disastrous Belmont mine fire of February 23rd in 1911 that killed 17 miners. The shaft was used as a rescue shaft to bring up the dead and injured. The shaft right here. The hero of the day was big Bill Murphy, who personally answered the distress calls from below, rode the cage down to the bottom where there was an inferno and the fire was breaking out. There was He couldn't breathe. The smoke was spreading everywhere and brought many men to safety. On the third trip, he never returned. After the Tonopah Belmont Development Company basically ceased operations in 1929, the Desert Queen was hardly ever mined again. Occasional leasers removed small amounts of ore through the 1940s. Since then, very little activity has occurred here. These are relevant sites. That's freaky. I walk. The wind's blowing so hard that the door, there's a door, and it just keeps swinging, slamming shut, and cranking. Wow. Workshop area. That's cool. Trying to take some EMF. Haven't gotten any EMF. That doesn't mean the place is not haunted. It just means I haven't gone to the right locations or maybe, you know, it's easy to miss activity. A ghost could have appeared in this mill an hour ago and I just missed it. <laughs> you just never know. But if you don't look and you don't try, you don't know. It's one of the most preserved head frames from its day in the Wild West. And this is a beauty. It's a beauty. Just like any mill in mine, you got to be careful. These steps are a lot newer and safer. <laughs> but I know my mills, and I know what's safe and what's not by looking at its architecture. And I'll tell you what, I've seen dilapidated steers you just don't take. But these ones are very solid. The nails are still in them good. <sighs> the railings are newer. You can tell by the age of the wood. It's pretty safe. But do not try this at home. Do not even try this if you visit here. <sighs> However... <sighs> Since I'm going to be promoting tourism here and research of Tonopah on our site and bringing in a lot of revenue to the town, 
I have to be very thorough and try to do as much as I can and show as much as I can. And so I'm going to show you guys this, the Desert Queen. This is the hoist right here. The ore bins. The hoist basically, you have ore kegs, you have cages. The cages go down to the bottom of the shaft for over a thousand feet. While at the same time, besides lowering the cage or uh, what today is known as an elevator, the hoist would pull up the ore from the bottom of the mine. You could, the miners would load the ore on ore carts or, or giant kegs, sometimes as much as five to seven tons. And they would pull it up, it would hit the chute, be dumped down, and then you see how there's tracks right here? It would be dumped into the ore carts and then dumped either in the dump pile or the tracks would lead to a mill, a processing mill, and they would process the gold and silver. That's a control room. Whoa. Woohoo. Yes, be very careful. Like I said, do not try this at home and watch where you're walking. It's very it's a very preserved building, but no less, they are old buildings and you do have to use caution. These are much newer, these boards right here. You can tell by the age and the cracks that some of the boards have been replaced. Like I said, new mining was revitalized here and there, and that's what happened. Every time the mill became abandoned, they had to come in and renovate it a little to get it operable again. Wow. Some urban exploring here. Lots of rust and machinery. This is how you'd fire up these giant wheels or cogs or hoisting machinery. This hoisting machinery, you would... The levers would operate different wheels. It was more complicated than you think. It wasn't just pulling a lever. You had to crank it, and then you had to tug on two different levers while maybe moving one of the levers up or down to give it power. It's pretty cool. But I gotta get back to my family. They're waiting for me in the vault having a picnic and I'm off doing a Urbex paranormal picnic here. If anybody's here, me give me a sign you are here. He's talking to the recorder. Are you here with me? And I'd like to go to the North Star Mill and Mine. Actually, it's, you, you can kind of, you can't really see it, but if you take the road on the back side of these ore chutes, on the other side of if you look, you see how there's mines up there? You have to go all the way around. It's a, it's a rough hike. And it's very icy and snowy and very windy. It's something we can't do since it's closer to the peak. Yeah. It would just be, I'd just be a fool trying to get up to the top. But I do got to get back to my family. But the North Star, it's way up at the peak of Mount Adi. This is Mount Adi. I've shown you it in some of the videos and pictures. I just didn't say anything. Named after the governor and senator who lived in Belmont and eventually Tonopah. So we're going to head on out of here. There's Mount Adi. The mine's way up on the top. It's pretty high up. you got to go around the mountain and switch back and make your way up to the... Yoo-hoo! I'm coming, son. I'm sorry. I got carried away. I just need one more picture. You all right? You all right? You were worried? Oh man, I'm fine. I just I went in to investigate the mill. It's very small. It has these huge hoist machinery where they hoist the cage down for the miners and then the ore up through. They would bring, this is the Desert Queen. This is one of the most famous head frames in the Wild West. It's one of the most intact ones. But check this out. They'd bring up the ore dump it in the ore bin, see the tracks, carry it on these tracks, and out to be processed to the mill over at the, probably the Grizzly Mill. Pretty cool, huh? 
Why don't you stand in front of it, man? I'll get your picture. It's lit up. See the lights? This is lit up at night. We seen this. We seen this head frame from our hotel. Our hotel. Our hotel. Right down below. When you stand down there near the Vispa, below you can see the head frame. No. Go to the edge of the door. This is this used to have ore cart tracks. See the wood ties? Just be careful, man, standing up here. It's gonna narrow. You can get a good I can get a good picture or video record record of it. It's called the glory hole. It collapsed, dude. When it collapsed, you can see, look, if you look, there's the mine shaft along the road. Remember we were looking in that huge crevice? Yeah, that's how you got down into the mine, into the cavern. That whole cavern collapsed. It was so loud when it collapsed. This whole area shook like an earthquake. Yep. That's a shaft, ladies and gentlemen. There's a hoisting cage over it. And this wench. Which way do we go? Straight, right? Okay. Oh, there's the vault. That's Mount Oak. And no, I was not climbing Mount Oak. Because I knew if I climbed it, it'd take another two hours. Plus, it's too windy and cold. I can't really get video up at the peak. There's a mine up there, but I can't, like I say, it's a hell of a hike. It's not a bad hike. I don't think it's bad. I could go straight up the side right here and be to the top. That's what I would probably do, but that's just me. But you're good. You tracked me. I'm proud of you. You found me in the middle of nowhere. And there's the old tracks of the Tonopah Goldfield Railroad, which we'll talk about when we're below the trestle. That's the safe, that's the vault, that's the door. And we're heading down to visit, well, according to Tammy, she said that this person was not a serial killer, that people were making up, huh? What is that? Snow fell in it. Look. See, the snow? It was not claws. <laughs> So I'll, I'll get into the we'll go visit the cabin that this woman lived in. However, I think people embellish the story a little because she, there wasn't many female murders back in the mid 1900s. And so the problem is, is that when a female did it, everyone was shocked and rumors ran amiss because people thought, oh, you know, she killed 20 people. That's how it was during that time. Oh yeah, look at these walls right here. Oh, for this mill. Do you know what this mill is? Did it say or no? Nah? Do you know what it was called or nah? Next to the vault, excuse me. I just want to know the name. It's not marked, huh? It might be part of the Montana, but I'm not sure. It could be another, it could be part of the Desert Queen, the mill too. You know, Montana to Paul. Oh, because there's another mill down there, but it's just walls. Oh, okay. Huh. The, what, the mill that's down on the other end is made with giant stone blocks, like huge stone blocks. Oh. No, it just says be careful, be safe, because some parts are not fenced off, and people tend to go past. I mean, there's a lot of guys that go past, you know what I'm saying? I'm not the only one. I mean, I've seen pictures on the web. The only difference is I did a little, try to do a little more. This is just the Barbara Graham house, which is right here. Nice deep snow. When is there, there snow? Welcome to winter. I think our winters are gonna be like this every year exploring. I don't think we're gonna avoid it unless we get another mild winter where it's 60 degrees all winter long. But like the guy said in the office, they need the snow as much here as they need it anywhere else. Whoa! Holy shit! Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. 
That go go to your left. Your left to go around. Don't go there. That's probably like a mine shaft, man. <laughs> nah. It's just a it's just like a wash that goes down, a groove, and it's filled with snow. Barbara Graham. According to Tammy, she was doing some research. She was involved in some theft that gone wrong and was with two bad seeds. You know how you hang with the wrong friends. And I guess one of the men probably pistol whipped, more than likely pistol whipped and killed this woman and then robbed her. And this woman had gotten blamed and she probably didn't even do it. But they call her the butcher and I'm not sure why. Because I don't think this woman, I said earlier on the hill when I was walking, I was like, yeah, she probably chopped up people because that was the rumor i remember hearing that name and there people make rumors and oh she mutilated her victims she chopped off their limbs and arms you know there are serial killers like that but this woman was accused of pistol whipping someone and she don't think she ever claimed that she was guilty or did it i think that the guy she was with did it and put it on her and she was just tagging along is what i think of course you know i mean that's there's a lot there was movies about this according to what Tammy told me when I had gotten back and I didn't know that now I do well the military is very dominant in this area there's air bases the money the gems stolen gems stolen jewelry oh secret stash the Barbara Graham house Wow Folks, this is a typical miner. This probably was a miner's cabin, and Barbara Graham came to live here because life was simple, and back in that day, you could practically buy a cabin like this for pennies, especially if it was abandoned by the miners and the miners ceased. People would come to Tonopah, and they would physically rent a house. This would be renting a house for, for peanuts, and your house would have the bed. The bed would be in the corner. You have, like I said, a little wood stove, a little cabinet, maybe area to eat you put up a chair and that's it that's it um, this oh yeah it's like a little uh, little can of beans filled with some sagebrush so Cowan because it's probably a miner that lived here before or after the Barbara Graham house she was called the butcher what else was she called bloody huh bloody but bloody, ba bloody babs Barb the Butcher, just, I don't know. People used to spread rumors. Back then, like I say, it was very uncommon for women to be killers unless you were dealing with the uh, Lizzie Borden case. But I'm going to go in and I'm going to show you. The ceilings are low, so I don't want to hit my head. But this would be a typical miner's cabin, and this would probably be a secret stash area where the floorboards lift up and you could store your valuables while you're out working or going around town doing your business. Nice view of Mount Odie. Wow. And just so everyone realizes, there's one other thing I want to state, is that Barbara Graham was executed in the state of California. As a matter of fact, they called her a butcher of Burbank. Was she really a butcher? I don't think so. Usually when they call someone a butcher, it's because they're mutilating, or serial killer mutilating people, but she didn't... From what I've read, she didn't mutilate anybody. She pistol whipped somebody or got accused of it. And she had gotten executed along with her accomplices. And it's quite strange. Because nowadays, you have that you have that kid that recently was drinking and driving and doing narcotics. Influenza kid. And he killed four, took the lives of four people. He gets probation. This woman gets accused of pistol whipping somebody, and guess what? And guess what? She ends up going to jail and being executed. By cyanide. Death by cyanide. One of the most ways to die. Some pretty harsh roads. He wasn't kidding, but as long as you take your time, you should be all right. We could, we could physically say we've done this entire area. Yeah, I know those are cool. Old rusty machinery. Yep. Go stand by this. Go stand down there. You don't have to get right in front. Just stand on the road that's there. That way I can kind of show how big the machinery is because this machinery is gigantic. 
This is the old train trestle right here. So you can see the tracks. Oh. <laughs> Look at all that lumber stored. All used for the mines. The timbers for the shafts. What we'll do is we'll go over here and then we'll cut down to the walkway and you can stand under the bridge. There's plaque under it. I already looked. Well, I'm gonna get a Jared, I'm gonna get a picture up here, at least of me by the tracks. I can't go on them, but I can stand kinda up here. This is all that remains of Tonopah Goldfield Railroad, which ran the Tonopah to Goldfield to Beatty or Beatty, and then it ran to Rhyolite, Bullfrog, near Bullfrog, all ghost towns I've been to, and eventually Southern Nevada's Las Vegas. And you can see this is all that remains. There's, there's only a few tracks, and they're bent. So it's not like there's much to see. But it's still a good area just to kind of film and get an idea. The railroad ran from 1906 to 1940. 1906 to 1940. It's very windy. Yeah. He almost fell. It reached Beatty, like I said, joint trackage lights with Brock Road or Bullfrog Gold Field Railroad and Rhyolite, as I was saying. From 1908 to 1914, the Bullfrog Gold Field Railroad, which also was serving mines around Beatty, was combined with the TNT Railroad and then combined again. And I want to mention something, just so everybody knows, I've been to Rhyolite before and I've been, I've snuck under the fence in Rhyolite and I did the old train station and there was like music playing when I went in and it sounded like people were laughing and drinking. I was by myself. Now to make matters worse, we seen this like 15 foot flying beast in the desert and then my ex didn't want to get out of the car and I'm like then you stay in the car and I'll go wander in the desert. You could hear that thing flying around making noise and I'm like what is it? What is it? You know? But the railroad ran up there. <laughs> Ghost towns and mines and railroads were abandoned quite quickly. Nothing lasted. But people also referred to this as the Tonopah Goldfield Railroad. Then again, TNT. It was all the same. I mean, you had you had narrow gauges, other branches, three different tracks. This trestle, though, that you see, it says it's the only remaining structure of the Tonopah Goldfield Railroad, which was built in 1905, and it ran from Goldfield to Mina. And then, of course, it branched out a little, went to Vegas, Rhyolite. The railroad scrapped in 1946 at the end of World War II and the deactivation of Tonopah Army Eel at the end of World War II and the deactivation of Tonopah Army Airfield. Loss of the railroad and higher prices supplies after the war put an ending to mining in Tonopah. Trucks were used in a few years, which proved too costly. And it says, note the coal bunkers underneath the trestle. The trestle is slated for restoration. Eventually, the rails of Tonopah and Goldfield Railroad will be replaced throughout the park as they once were. Yes, they are planning on restoring this railroad. Where are you, Jared? Oh. Nineteen oh five to nineteen forty six. Nineteen twenties when the coal bins were added. Just a miner shack, huh? The Mizpah Mine Powder Magazine. You know, it's a magazine. They store dynamite 1902 to 1948. Used to store all dynamite, fuse, and blast caps used in the Tonopah Mining Company mines. Right next to the railroad. So if this explodes, there goes the trestle and the train. Wow. This is quite extensive compared to the other dynamite or powder keg vault or storage area. I can't. It's very muddy. It's harder back here, but it's good for EVPs. Whoa, dude. Wow. We're about to go inside the Burrow Mine Tunnel. It's just another mine here. The Tonopah Mining Company owned most of these, or bought them up. Howard Hughes also bought about 100 claims at one time. Well, back in Buffalo, they had the Howard Hughes Corporation. It was a large building. It's just amazing how everything connected. A lot of people back east had ties out west. They really did. And you have to understand, when you look at governors and senators and famous miners and outlaws, they all had connections to Tonopah and Virginia City and all the places that we've gone to. And the nice thing is, 
is that on our website, all these places I can hotlink. Like if a go if if Belmont's a sister town or something happened in Belmont related to Tonopah, I can always hotlink it. We do a lot of hotlinking on our journeys out here in the Wild West because five, six places might all be tied together. So that way you can go on our site, you can click a hot link and be like, damn, it's another two, three ghost towns. Pretty cool. But it's very extensive. And the thing is that we have we have a lot of different places that we're behind the hotel. We're staying next to the Mispa. And so when you stand at the bottom where the Mispa is and you look up, you see the head frame for the Desert Queen way high up. Like I said, it's rather extensive. Head frames are huge. Teamsters. Once the ore was mined and sacked, it had to be hauled out of the railroad that the task and trust of the Teamsters. They drove teams of mules, horses, or both. Each Teamster was assisted by a swamper who watered and fed the team at each stop. Each stop was 60 miles to the railhead at Sodaville. We've also been to Sodaville. Creepy, creepy place. Horse drawn whim. Wow. Got a nice old car there. Some more old machinery. And now we're going to be entering the burrow tunnel. It says, Into the depths, look above. You'll see a large head frame, the Mispa mine on the hill. I just showed you guys it. Imagine entering a cage at the bottom of that head frame. You'd be lowered 1,500 feet more than a quarter of a mile the depth of the Mispa shaft. When you reach the bottom of the cage open, you'd enter a tunnel similar to the one you see here. That is so cool. Of course, they used to have candles lit, and or later on, they brought electricity. They, they had electrical power, and sometimes they used lanterns as well. Very dangerous work. Very dangerous. Very dark. And the summer is hot. It says right here that they use candles along the walls. Here's the burrow tunnel. It says a recreation of one of many tunnels which lie under this mining park. As you enter, notice the heavy timbers. And it says um, the burrow vein was discovered by Jim Butler in 1900. And the digging opened up the stope and the tunnel was built to bring out ore. So we're going to go visit a sh mine shaft right now. This was one of Jim Butler's original discoveries made in 1900 and the stoke was a few hundred feet down, at least 500 feet and they were dug to the Mispa shaft to remove the ore via hoist. It was one of the first tunnels. Do we need flashlights? Oh. This was one of the earliest tunnels. Like I said, eventually this tunnel, the shaft, led to the Mispa mine so they could hoist up the ore, but this is one of the first tunnels. Discovered by, well, Jim Butler discovered it, and then they started mining it. As the more silver came in, so did the amount of funding that they had. Where's this cage, man? Is this the cage? No. Oh. Holy shitola. I didn't know you could see 500 feet to the bottom. Well, you can't see to the bottom, but... Oh yeah, you can't see to the bottom. I hope you guys like heights. Let's see if I can get my lens in there. Holy shit. That's 500 feet down. Dude, hold on. I need to put my recorder here. If I drop it, I'm screwed. Here, now let me... There we go. Slats are too big. Here I am holding it to the slats. Oh crap. Here is a much better look right here. The timbers and its support and then the shaft goes down, drops. I've seen a shaft like this drop off earlier in the beginning of mine where it had a ledge of wood boards you see right below and then it dropped off again because there was different levels that the miners would work. It would like continuously drop off level after level. Holy shit. It's 500 feet down man. Look at this. That's crazy. Jeez. What? Ooh, you don't want to lose the sunglasses. 
this shaft is the deepest, straight down. Well, they have right, right below me, there's a hole, you see it? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. There's like a straight hole. Miners would die all the time. They'd fall to their deaths. They'd lose their grip. They'd be on these, you see this wood board, folks? They'd stand on these little wood beams. And they'd be sometimes connected to a rope, but they'd all connect the miners. One would fall, and three or four would fall, and... There was caging accidents where the cage would slip or men would ride the cage the top because back then there was no OSHA or safety rules. A lot of rocks on top of this thing. Jesus Christ, Mary and Joseph. I hope people like heights because this I'm standing above a mine shaft. And I knew about this, but I I mean you can see between the bars, that's you zoom on in. You can't even see the bottom. You see cross beam after cross beam. Welcome to the depths of hell. Holy shit. Also, ladies and gentlemen, be careful, man, not to drop that camera between the... Yeah, I know. I put my recorder over there, safety precaution. Anyhow, folks, you can see... They would sometimes drill holes and put TNT in them. In other cases, they would put these anchors in. That way they could anchor the miners via rope. As they would be lowered, they'd lower down into the shaft and work. They would mine along the walls, and it would just get deeper and deeper and deeper. And then eventually you'd put the cross beams in, which were at the Tonopah Mining Company. They would cut them to the appropriate size. It's quite the operation here. And you may have gone down to the bottom of the mine, taken this tunnel or this shaft, but you wouldn't be able to go this way. There would probably be another way down. And then you'd go, it probably goes down... There's a machine right here too, a jack for drilling. Back then they didn't they used pickaxes. Then when power jacks came to be, it was a lot more efficient. But by then the mining boom had ended. You don't see too many places are wheelchair accessible. Of course, I don't know how someone would feel being on a wheelchair looking 500 feet down. I mean, but of course here I am. I'm putting my face to the grate, looking straight down. I can't take EMF readings either. There's electricity running through here. There's wires. See, that's the thing. Other other people, like with the mitzvah, people are taking EMF readings where there's power boxes in the basement. They're like, oh, we got ghosts. Hell no. Hell no. You got to use some science and reasoning behind what we do. We get stuff, but we're honest. It may be once in a while. It's not every trip. It's not every place. Those people do one place a year, and all of a sudden they got ghosts. You might have to do 20 places to get the ghost. And certainly power boxes don't count. Huh? Yes. It's one of the last sights before we head out of Old Tonopah. The hoist men. Yes, they used to hoist people up and down from the borough tunnel. It didn't matter how big or small the mine was. Miners' tools and dynamite had to be hauled in, or tools and miners had to be hoisted out. The head frame with big money came. Head frames were built above the shaft. Electricity generated by steam powered the hoist. The size of the motor determined the capacity of the hoist. The MISPA head frame under construction in 1902. The whim. The apparatus allowed two men and a mule to hoist five-ton rock from a 300-foot level in eight hours. It's old-school mining equipment. And I also film a lot of the relics of the past in case they're no longer here. We put uh, we also put pictures on our site so people can kind of see the mining equipment and learn about it and what it does. I always talk about these type of things on our website. Very relevant, very relevant. And this little road down here leads out. It actually leads downtown Tonopah. They stored their dynamite. You can see if you look. Magazine explosives dangerous, as I was saying earlier. Each miner mill area kind of had a powder keg area. It was not uncommon. And there are some mines that are deep and you do not want to cross. I'm glad that they have barbed wire, chain link fencing, barbed wire, and then chicken coop fencing. Basically, two layers of keg. 
right here is the mine and the shaft. Some of them go anywhere from a few feet to sometimes a thousand feet down. And I've been to mines, mine areas that go 3,000 feet down. Start at the top of the mountain and go all the way to below the mountain. For example, you see Mount Odie? Yeah, 1,500 feet down, the bottom of the mountain. I have a shaft on top and a shaft on bottom. It was quite intricate back in the day. We have to brave snow. And I know on this trip, you guys have probably heard me breathe like a monster, but I'm asthmatic. When I was a kid, stepfather used to be abusive, locked me in the car with smoke. And uh, it's hard to breathe. My lungs are healthier because I smoke weed. Because it doesn't have chemicals or it's pretty pure and kind of cleanses out the lungs a little. And I know that sounds a little weird. Oh, you smoke. It doesn't clean out the lungs. It's not true. You don't want to put cigarettes, all these cigarettes in your system and smoke all this shit. But pure 420 and herb does wonders. But anyhow, you know, like I said, it's, this weather is taking a toll on me. Because the thing is, the thing is, dude, is that it's cold, the winds are blowing, we're hiking uphill in snow, we're sliding. It's a difficult, this is one of the more difficult investigations between Belmont and Tonopah the last two days. It's been difficult. But we've done it. So the whole thing you have to understand is that you know, we've been going non-stop for almost three days, so I'm pretty beat. I'm, I'm just about at my limit, and I still got a four-hour drive ahead of me home. But we had a nice time. I ate breakfast at Tonopah Station, dinner at the Mispa Hotel, had a nice pizza at their famous Pizza Works place, her family pizza restaurant that's found here. We need to be really careful crossing this bridge. Well, it's not going to collapse, but you could easily drop your smaller equipment like recorders or anything you're carrying on you. you could just drop and fall through the slats. It's another mine shaft though you can stand over and look down. And it may not look deep, but it continues over there where it's dark. It's another drop off for hundreds of feet. The blacker it is, the deeper the mine. It's phenomenal though, they have bridges crossing everything. So you really get to enjoy the mines here just as much, the shafts and all the structures. And There was only one building we could not go in. It was the warehouse, which I was a little disappointed. I wanted to see some of the old, what was stored in there. I looked, I want to see like the office and all, but I understand, you know, it's winter time and it's probably closed because it sits on the edge. And you know, people try to steal artifacts and it ruins it for everybody else. Everybody else. But the mines, not very far from downtown. Now, were they? And so we're heading out. I'm going to go talk to the caretaker for a little bit. See this mine shaft? All it did was connect it over here. A lot of tunnels connected. A lot of tunnels. It's a beautiful place. And like I said, I have no regrets coming here. No regrets. I'm glad we had the opportunity to investigate it. The caretaker is really nice. He gave us a lot of in intel and information so that I could make these wonderful videos and interview people and learn a little more. That way it helps better everyone else's research who wants to, across the other side of the world, who wants to know about Tonopah's history. It's about as wild west as you can get. It's hard to believe I've stood all the way to the, at the Desert Queen mining frame, and here I am, standing below it now. But these wagons, back then, the ore, the tents, all that had to be hauled via horse wagon before the railroad came to be back in the day. They used mules and horses. Old school. Eventually, then it was the railroad, then it was trucks. You know, you can see the transition through time. And the John Livermore Event Center, that was also part of the mining complex back in the day, and it's been converted to a museum and a visitor center. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool.
Well, the weather's not looking so good. We have one or two more little mills that we need to visit. They're not really that little. And then we have a haunted school. I'm coming. Yes, sir. Huh? You gonna get ready? I'm going up the cans. She said she's freezing. So I'm gonna need to set my bags in there. I know. I know you won't leave me. I sure hope not. I won't want to drive the drive I'm about to drive. <laughs> Good luck to you. Another thing about the slats on that bridge, if you're holding your car keys or your cell phone, you're going to drop it. That's what I meant by equipment or belongings. You want to make sure you want to make sure you secure your belongings. You really do. It's very important. Very important. Because there are, the bridges have slats and you can drop stuff. Like my recorder will fit right between the slats, it's gone. And I have audio from all our investigations. I try to record them. I, I also do that on purpose because here's the thing we have investigators join us and they like to make up shit. So, what I normally do when people make up shit, I try to disprove them, basically. I'm like, well, I got it on recording. Some girl tried to say that I uh, grabbed her ass on the investigation. I recorded the whole investigation. You don't even hear her talking. The only time we're ever together talking is where we're taking readings together. So, you know, that's why we do it. But also, we're always trying to record audio of EVPs. Audio and video and photos are all important. There's a lot of relevancy in paranormal investigating. you got to have all three, if possible. We started, over the years we've been upgrading, I started off with pictures, then EVPs, then video. And now we just got some really good stuff going on. From all our trips and investigations, because, because we're trying to be thorough and do everything we can. It's an old wagon wheel. It's almost as tall as I am, but it had to support the weight of the ore. Hence its size. The ore wagons had tons of ore. And without having an iron cog with the spokes to stabilize it and a wooden frame inside, you couldn't do it. But because of having wagon wheels this size and this strong, you were able to carry tons of ore across the open desert to be processed or shipped out to the railroad. We're leaving the old Tonopah and the, where all the mines and mills are located above Tonopah or downtown. I just want to say, I know I went over it when I was at the Desert Queen. Because where that head frame is, that's the Desert Queen mine. 17 miners were killed. And I was talking about how this man went down three times to save many miners and the third time he never came back. So you can understand why it was so important for me to go inside that mine hoist house and near the shaft to try to take some EVPs. Because men died in those shafts. Sometimes the bodies were never even found. They were so deep and, you know, the, the mines would be on fire for days and the bodies would be cremated. But we're out of here. And just saying bye to the Desert Queen mine. I was up there, baby. I was up there. It's one of the most prominent head frames in the U.S. It, actually, in Nevada, actually, anywhere, it's in such good shape. It almost looks brand new. It's amazing. Just amazing. If you're a guy, you'll understand. Head frames are amazing. One last look. Right below the residence. The Desert Queen. Jim Butler's dream. It is Jim Butler's dream. And uh, it led to his success. And the building of Tonopah, Nevada.